Welcome to the Wicked Ones Podcast. This is Jen. And this is Tara. What's going on? It's Groundhog's Day again. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I know we say that all the time, but guys, seriously, we're not... We're, no. we're not going to bring you a recipe sponsored by the Wicked Ones today <laughs> or any any cauliflower facts. No. <laughs> no <laughs> I am going to tell you about a podcast that I binged over oh, yeah. the weekend. You were telling me. Um, it's not new. It came out last mm-hmm. February, but it's called Dying for Sex. It's actually oh. from Wondery. Have you heard of it? I haven't. So... It's a little graphic. Um, Two best friends, and the one is diagnosed with terminal breast cancer. Oh. And it's sad. It's but it's uh, I really loved it. So it's graphic. It's dying for sex. She goes on these like sexual escapades in the beginning, kind of. I don't know. You have to listen. It's actually so good. Okay. So it's, it's pretty graphic mm-hmm. sexually okay. in the beginning. Um, but it's really, that's not what the podcast is about. It yeah, feels like that's what yeah. it's about, but it is not. It, like, I will say, in the, it had me laughing hysterically and, like, crying. Like, tears. The whole podcast. Like, Well, I know I don't, I don't take recommendations from you lately. Usually when you recommend something, it's pretty good. So. Yeah. So that's, it was two best friends. And to hear them genuinely talk about her journey with cancer and her story. Yeah. Probably wanted to get it out there too, before, you know, since she's, she was sick. She's sick. Yeah. And um, she also wrote a book. Molly is her name. And now I want to read it. So. Oh, it's well, thank the, you for that. There's two seasons. I, I only binged the first season, and it was quick. Okay. I mean, it was, I think it's like five episodes. Well, I will try to listen to it before our next recording so I can weigh in. Yeah. I'll put it on my, because I've been trying to kind of bounce around different podcasts and kind of see what's going on there. So, yeah, so I was deciding that I needed a break from murder. From murder. So <laughs> I came across this. I was like, oh. I was yeah. like, well, this looks kind of edgy and should be happy because I don't know why, but then I read and got into it. And I'm like, well, that definitely wasn't what I expected it to be, but it ended up being a good one. Nice. All right. Well, I'm definitely going to check that one out. Yeah, that's about it. That's the highlight of my weekend. Hey, that's, you know what? That's probably better than the highlight of a lot of people's weekends lately. <laughs> definitely better than mine. You do not know want to know what we did at my house. I mean, I, I don't know. It was, it was boring. Well, then tell me your story. Maybe that'll... Yeah. So, well, I did work on my story, so I guess that wasn't boring. I did prepare for you all, so you're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So I am going to go into a story that I chose, and it's another dark one, so I'm just going to apologize up front for that. But this one really hit me hard when I was doing the research, too, because, you know, you and I, along with, I'm sure a lot of our listeners, enjoy going camping. Right. So you guys will understand why this hit me harder than some of the other, you know, some of the other cases that we've covered. Um, Because camping with our families has been a big part of our lives. I mean, our kiddos grew up spending a big part of their childhood the past few years traveling and camping together. And I I've kept thinking about this story. Long after I wrote it, it makes me thankful that we were able to collect the amazing memories that we had, you know, and that we felt safe when we went out and when we were together. Yeah, I yeah. was always the phone police. Well, this I'm always is like, don't true. stop at that person's campsite. Right. Because there was a false sense of security when we were camping. The kids mm-hmm. thought they could ride their bikes around and everyone was there to be nice and friendly. And mm-hmm. can we pet those That's dogs? True. And remember? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I do. But at the same time, after reading this story, I was happy for the, for the, I guess what you call false sense of security, I was happier for that because of the fact that we were around other people and it was, we weren't alone in the wilderness. We weren't desolate. We weren't, right. Mm -hmm. Like there was a general store where you could go for Mm -hmm. anything that you forgot and there were a lot of friendly people out. we camped at like the Disney of campgrounds. Oh, absolutely. We weren't roughing it. No. Except for that one time in Iowa, but that's (laughs) another podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Totally is. But yes, for the most part, we would, we were glamping. Yeah. Um, So I appreciated our style of camping so much more. Okay, so the year is 1982. It's the first week of August in British Columbia, Canada, 
and just like here in the States, it's August. It's definitely one of the best months for camping, right? Like the weather's fantastic. Summer's fading into fall. So it's just beautiful wherever you, wherever you decide to go. Bob and Jackie Johnson and their two little girls, Janet, who was 13, and Karen, 11, made plans with Jackie's parents, George and Edith Bentley, to head out on a big, fun-filled camping trip that would last two whole weeks. So two weeks, that's a huge trip. I mean, mm-hmm. we've done that before. We were, you know, traveling across the country, staying at a lot of different places. It sounds like they were just heading to this one area, and they were going to, that's where two they were going to be for two weeks. Yeah. I just want to stop really fast and ask, do you know where I'm going with this? Have you heard this story? Um, I heard of it. Okay. I don't know how much details I remember, but I've... Okay. I forgot to ask you that in the beginning, if you had... If you yeah, had heard a story of it. So, I'm sure they were all looking very forward to it. I can already see Jackie, right? Stressed out, but excitedly packing for her entire family, making lists like we do who, packing up the sheets, pillows, bug spray, plenty of cooking supplies, probably worried, oh my god, we're going to be out in the middle of nowhere, and I, if I forget something, you know, every year when we first start doing the camping trips, we're sharing, you know, lists trying to not forget anything. Yes, yes. And also, probably trying to make sure they have enough food and snacks, you know how it is, like, you can't leave s'mores off the list and you're trying to make sure you have enough to make easy meals, you know, to get you through. And Bob, if he's like our guys, he was probably checking the tires, packing grilling supplies and making sure that he had all the gear, you know, all the, all the manly stuff for them to be comfortable in the wilderness. Once they were packed up, they all left their home in Kelowna and they headed to Wells Gray Provincial Park, which is approximately a three and a half hour drive. So not too bad, but mm-hmm. far enough to get away, you know. Looking back at all the photos that I found online, the park itself is gorgeous. I mean, that's an understatement, right? Like, type it in, close your eyes, pick a picture, and make it your screensaver, and you'll be like... Oh, that's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah, no, it's it's just gorgeous. I think if we live closer to Canada, this is a trip that the guys would have taken us on, for sure. So, and here's just a little bit more about the park so that you can further imagine its appeal as a destination where the Bentleys and the Johnsons decided, you know, to take such a long vacation, or as they say in Canada, a long holiday, right? Um, It's the fourth largest park in British Columbia. It covers approximately 1.3 million acres, and it's definitely a destination where you expect to be one with nature, like I mentioned. I keep mentioning that because it's important. They have amazing hiking trails. You're surrounded by wildlife. And as of today, there are 41 waterfalls there that have been discovered and named. So, I mean, it's just beautiful. It's also home to the largest paddle-only lake, which is Myrtle Lake. And it's just as still and calm and amazing as you might imagine, right? No motorized vehicles are allowed. So it's just for, like, canoeing, paddleboarding, that kind of thing, relaxation. Mountains are surrounding it in the background. I mean, it's a dream location for anyone who loves camping or lake life. Like, I imagine this would be someplace that we would want to go. I know we want to go to Montana, but I think this should be on our list, too. So once they arrived and they settled in, they set up their camp in a secluded area near Old Bear Creek Prison. Okay? And (laughs) I had a feeling that you would have questions about this. Well, first, I want to know, is it a campground, or do you just go and so, make your own site? You kind of just go and make your own site there. Like, from what I check understand, no. But so, no, it didn't sound like there was anyone to check in with. There's three different op- openings. Like, there's three different entrances, I should say. They took the main entrance near the town of Clearwater, and they. it just sounds like they drove in about 11 miles in, and then they found this campsite, which, as I said, was right next to the old prison site, which, and again, I I figured that you would have questions about this because, and I was curious too, so I looked it up, and it's it's not only an interesting side note, but it actually kind of comes into play later in the story, so I just want to tell you quickly a little bit about that, and then it kind of explains to you where, like, you can probably imagine better their site. Back in 1957, the provincial government and the Department of Corrections decided to build a minimum security prison there in Upper Clearwater, okay? So at the time, it housed about 60 inmates with a 14-guard staff, so it was smaller, and it was actually known as Bear Creek Corrections Camp. In the 60s, then, they built a sawmill, and they trained the inmates to work and gain experiences, basically, to help them find employment Mm -hmm. after their release, you know? Um, so they made mostly posts, timbers, planks for fences and bridges, other government projects. And it was actually beneficial for the inmates as well as the community because they did other maintenance jobs around the parks and they helped clear snow for the senior citizens and they had cut trails and they just so many side jobs. They yeah, couldn't even know them all here. Yeah, all of that. 
And then in 1978, the Bear Creek camp was relocated and rebuilt up by their mill. So it's like a mile or so away is where they put the new prison. They left their old site empty near the main road, and this is what became a convenient place for people to camp overnight when they traveled to the park. This It was this area that was cleared out and, and you know, that the prisoners had previously used that was just great for families to settle in and stay, and it was right next to Bear Creek. Because I always want to camp next to an abandoned prison. Right next to an center. abandoned prison. Yeah, no. I know. I know. I know. I thought the same Here's thing. Here's this giant empty <laughs> Scary building I'm going to camp next to. No. It reminds me of The Walking Dead a little bit. I was like, ah, sure, but I would want to be like, okay, kids. But I mean, maybe you could. We would see pull up and Steve would say, isn't this amazing? And then I would see us three <laughs> just standing there staring at it going, no. Does that say prison? <laughs> uh, is that barbed wire? <laughs> no. Stella would be on her phone reading all the stats about it. No, I just. Right? But okay, sorry. No, no, I get no, that's it. okay. So, I mean, I think. Well, I was waiting for it to be like, oh, it's turned into a facility with showers or this, but it just sounds like it's a big empty building and it was probably well maintained around it, which mm-hmm. I imagine would be an yeah. ideal place. Like, I almost it. think you probably couldn't see the prison from where they were. They were just down by the creek it's and it was scary. cleared out, you know? Well, I mean, but it's to me, in the darkness. you're probably going down this road and there's just, there's nowhere else to park and put, you know, everything's overgrown. I have a feeling, you know, there's probably not a whole lot of places that you can put a tent and park your car, so... This became family campground, right? This is where you, this is where people went. I'm going to roll with it. Yeah, roll with it. The Bentleys did. So they arrived with their truck and camper van with a boat on top. Okay, that's what they drove. Jackie's parents had also driven in uh, in their car. So it appears that the sleeping arrangements were that the grown-ups would sleep in the camper van and the girls had a tent just outside. Again, no. Yeah, I, I actually put in here, see? thoughts then? <laughs> because no that's terrifying I we like... went camping as a child my parents did the same thing they stayed in the camper and they put us outside in the tents mm-hmm. and I was I was trying to think back this is the 80s mm-hmm. this is what people did mm-hmm. the kids wanted to have mm-hmm. their own place our kids but... talked about that all the time one time can we sleep outside in tents and I would totally agree because I knew it was never gonna happen yeah I was never going along with it we would always forget the tent Oh, we forgot. Damn it. We forgot the tent. You're going to be locked in here with us so I can keep an eye on you. Yeah. (sighs) But, I mean, again, it's the 80s, carefree. They're in the middle of nowhere. They have no concerns. I mean, there are bears, but apparently there's no concerns. So I I looked back at the photos of the family, and a few of them appeared to either have been taken on this trip or other camping trips. The girls are in swimsuits with the fish they had caught. Another one of them with their grandparents. They're smiling with drinks and kind of what looked like like those old Tupperware bowls, you know? Mm-hmm. They're ready to eat. Um, the ones that you could either, like, take and seal. It had, like, a, you know, the top was oh, yeah. all, like, puckered. Or oh, sure. um, you could take it and, you know, heat it up and eat a meal in it. So it looked like they were getting ready to, to eat outside. And then there was another one of their parents in, like, you know, the classic 80s outfits um, with them. And, of course, they're wearing, like, the, you know, like, the short gym shorts that were in style back then. And feathered bangs. And they look like your your average, normal, happy family, you know. And I thought to myself, how cool is it that they all traveled and did these adventures together? Just kind of makes the story more heartbreaking, even, because... You don't really hear about that a lot with people, you know, three generations of families going and taking these long trips together and these long vacations. I mean, people don't do that as much anymore, right? No, I don't feel like it's done anymore. Mm -hmm. So the weeks go by and it's now August 16th and Bob doesn't show up for work at Gorman Brothers Lumber in West Bank. And this raised some questions because Bob, who is 44, had been working there for the past 25 years and he was not the type to miss a day of work. From what I read, he just, he never called in sick. So people were really worried. A week later, when he still hadn't shown up for work, his fellow co-workers reported him missing to the local authorities. And then this brought on a massive manhunt for the whole family. Because obviously they found that they weren't home. They weren't home. So the RCMP centered the manhunt on the Wells Gray Park area. But the search was unsuccessful and it failed to find any trace of the missing family. It wasn't until September 13th, five weeks later, a mushroom picker stumbles upon the remains of a burnout car in a clearing just off the mountainside logging road. To everyone's horror, police find 
a pile of burnt bones in the back seat, which were later identified as the incarcerated remains of the four missing adults. In the trunk were the remains of the two young girls. But those bodies were even in worse condition and appeared that whoever did that used an accelerant on their bodies. So forensics was able to determine that all six family members had been shot with a 22 caliber gun. As the search continued, the 1981 Ford truck camper, their boat, and the other belongings could not be located. So now, due to the fact that the car was found in such a remote area, locals would actually be the first questions. Of course, they're like, oh, you know, this could be a local that we're, that we're dealing with. So during their canvassing of the area, the locals who had seen the family set up near the creek were able to lead the police to their campsite. They were able to recover six spent 22 caliber shells along with some beer caps, which was the brand that Bob was drinking. And a few of the full bottles were also found cooling in the stream nearby and a couple of sticks with sharpened edges that you can use your imagination and probably think that the girls had been using those from roasting marshmallows. And I mean, you can just picture this family carefree and hanging out by this stream. So now fast forward to April 1983. The police still have found, they still have nothing to go on, but they aren't giving up, right? Not by a long shot. This is actually really cool to me, all of the things that they tried to do to figure out who killed this family. They have a reenactment of what happens filmed on the site where the murders took place and they broadcast this across Canada. When this failed to generate any leads and not really due to lack of callers and tips coming in, they just didn't have anything solid. Like everything was just a dead end. So then they decided to create an exact replica of the 1981 Ford truck and camper, sparing no detail. They even had the aluminum boat strapped to the top based on a tip that came in from a waitress that one just like this camper had been seen heading east with two French speaking males. The authorities assumed that it would be heading to Quebec. So that May, they ended up driving it through British Columbia up to Quebec. Now, before they hit each town in between, they had a press conference ahead of the arrival of the camper, hoping to get new information, generate new leads. Maybe somebody saw it. Maybe somebody knows the people who drove it, that kind of a thing. This led to over 1,300 tips being called in about the sightings, but all of them were a dead end. So then they even offered a $7,500 reward. They printed out over 10,000 posters and distributed them throughout post offices in North America. So they're trying to cover all their bases. Mm -hmm. The links they went to to catch this killer or killers is just impressive to me. I mean, it's a shame that it didn't lead to anything that would help. And by this time, they're out of ideas and the case just starts growing cold. So it wasn't until October, 14 months after the murders, two forestry workers would actually find the truck and camper near Bear Creek on another old logging road only 15 miles from the murder site and about 20 miles from where the car was found. It was really well hidden. It even looked like somebody like tried to drive it off the mountainside, but logs had blocked the pathway. Unfortunately for the RCMP, heavy public criticism came because, I mean... Um, yeah, it was only 15 miles yeah, away. Yeah, the close proximity of the area. Did you see my eyebrows go up? Like, yeah, yeah. They were like, what, how did you miss this? all this time this? on a reenactment and... Mm -hmm. So you are, they have all my feels. I'm on their team. I was going to say, you feel exactly how the public felt. They couldn't understand why that this was missed. But, you know, it would just nudge the police again to look at the locals who knew these abandoned logging roads well, right? Because, I mean, apparently, let's hope it was just so hidden that... I would say this would have to be locals. How would a some far-off person come wandering through this yeah. area. I mean, this is really way too coincidental. Sense. It Unless, doesn't make sense. Exactly. Unless they were thinking it was just another person camping there that happened to have been camping from who knows, right? Who has a 22 and it's going to take the whole family. I mean, it sounds like this is a desolate area and your chances of running into another camper mm -hmm. are rare. Yeah. No, Sorry. Uh, Go on. No, you're absolutely right. So they go back to Clearwater and they go door to door a second time, questioning possible suspects. It was this time around that they would find out that a local by the name of David William Shearing, a 24-year-old man living just three miles from the murder site, ding, 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 had been asking around about how to re-register a Ford pickup truck and repair a hole in the door. Okay, so this guy had been, he had the vehicle, there's a bullet hole in the door, he's trying to figure out how to fix this and re-register the truck, and... This never gets back to the police until the second round of questioning, which is okay. And the police actually hadn't given this information about the bullet hole to the public, so they knew 
obviously, Mm -hmm. they needed to look into this. So Shearing was taken into custody just before he was due to appear in court on a stolen property charge. He also had a record of assault and drug possession. Interestingly enough, though, looking at his background, he actually came from a good family, despite his criminal record. His recently deceased father had been a prison guard, and his brother was a sheriff. Shearing actually himself graduated from high school and completed a heavy mechanics course, so residents were shocked at his arrest. They didn't see this one coming. RCMP Police Detective Sergeant Mike Easton and Constable Ken Leibel knew that Shearing was guilty right away. Right away, they get him relaxed, they get him to start talking, and he starts confessing his crimes rather quickly. This could have been partly due to the fact that he was led to believe that his arrest was actually due to a hit and run that had occurred prior to the murders. We're finding out that this guy isn't quite as good of a guy as people are thinking that he might be. Um, He had accidentally run over a drunk on the roadway while driving with a friend back in 1980, and he never reported the accident. It just sounds like this is a, like you said, like a really desolate area where things happen and then people just don't know about it. If you can run somebody over. Yeah, and not report it and nobody even knows. Mm -hmm. So while he was still flustered with his confession... Eastham confronted him with the Bentley Johnson murders. And during the conversation, Shearing accidentally admitted that he heard the, bur- the murders were committed at Bear Creek. But again, this was information that was withheld from the public. I thought that was interesting because of the whole reenactment that they said that happened at the murder site and all of that. I don't know why this was in a couple of the articles that I read because it sounded to me like the public knew this. But maybe they were trying to say that he knew details about the murder site that just weren't, that weren't yeah. public. So once he confessed, Shearing agreed to reenact the murders for the police and turn over their possessions that he had stolen. At this point, he handed over the 22 that he used, which, crazy enough, he was one of the first people that had actually been questioned in the very beginning when all of this first started. And that 22 had been hanging on his wall the day that they questioned him. Just what a coincidence. sitting right there out That's in the open. And obviously we know you can't just take people's guns and no, test no, them no. without, you know, without probable cause. But... But it was this very gun that ended up being the murder weapon. So here's where I start to have more questions, and I'm sure that you will too. He confesses. He reenacts. He says that he shot all four adults, ambushing them while they sat enjoying their campfire. And then he shot the two girls as they slept in their tent. End of story. He cited his motive for the crime was robbery. He said he then loaded the bodies in the car, drove it to the mountainside when it was dark, and set it on fire using five gallons of gasoline. Then he cleaned up the site took the truck and camper back home, only to burn it later because he found out it was too hard to re-register. So, that's it. What do you think? Think he's lying? Yeah. Yeah, do you think maybe he's lying? <laughs> so, so <laughs> did I. Yeah, that's totally a lie. As soon as I read that and I, I remembered the extra accelerant used on the girls and just mm-hmm. it wasn't adding up for mm-hmm. me. And He wasn't alone. Well, he was alone. But that wasn't the whole story. You and I both know with people like this, all of the all of the murderers and the serial killers and everybody that we've done, that we've looked into profiling a little bit, we know that rarely is that just the motive. Well, and it just seems very, it seems buttoned up. Like, all right, that's what happened. That's what happened. Here you go. Mm-hmm. I'll reenact it for you. So luckily, Detective Mike Easton felt the same way. So sure, he confessed to the murders, but the detective knew that this wasn't the full story. Just like you and I, he had questions. He didn't have evidence to prove it, so this is what they had to run with as his full confession, right? So ultimately, Shearing would plead guilty um, the day that his trial was set to begin to six counts of second-degree murder. Supreme Court Justice Harry McKay said, and I quote, What we have, very simply, is a cold-blooded and senseless execution of six defenseless and innocent victims for no apparent reason. A slaughter that devastated three generations in a single bound. What a tragedy, what a waste, and for what? So April 17th, 1984, Shearing was sentenced to life in prison with no eligibility for parole for 25 years. This was the max possible sentence um, for second-degree murder at the time, and this was the first time in Canadian history that it was ever handed out. To me, that's... That seems still a little mm-hmm. forgiving. Oh, very forgiving. After the conviction, Detective Easton was able to re-interview Shearing, and he said, and I quote, 
You know I am here, David. I think you sexually abused those girls before you killed them. You told me some time ago that you would consider telling me the rest of the story after you were sentenced. Well, I'm here to collect David, and I'm not taking no for an answer. So Shireen came out with the full story. He wanted those girls, and he was determined to have them, even if it meant he had to kill them all. So after stalking the family for several days, he got up the nerve to commit these terrible crimes on August 10th. He walked into the campsite and he shot Bob first, then Jackie, and then George and Edith, one by one in cold blood. The girls were already in their tent for the night, so he went to them and he told them a biker gang was nearby and that their parents had ran for help. So while he told them to stay in the tent, he loaded the bodies of their parents and grandparents into the back seat of the family car and covered them with a blanket. He then crawled into the tent with the girls. He said that he kept both of them alive for nearly a week, staying at both his ranch and his small fishing cabin on the Clearwater River, repeatedly raping them and mm. just god awful things. Mm. I during this time while they were at the cabin, he was actually almost caught. A prison guard who was supervising the prisoners in the area who were fishing in the river had knocked on the door to let him know, "Hey, don't be alarmed." I've got some of the prisoners out here fishing in the river. Just wanted to let you know so that you weren't wondering what was going on. It was actually at this moment that both of the girls were still alive, and he hid them behind the door, telling them to be quiet. The guard sadly didn't notice anything. So <sighs> that part just really killed me. I was, as I was reading it, I mean, I know the story, and I'm just like, girls, say something, speak yeah. up, like scream, do something. Yeah, and I'm sure the prison guard was super preoccupied because I can see myself on a mission like that and just mm -hmm. knock on the door, don't even look up, don't even pay attention. I probably oh, couldn't even absolutely. describe the person who answered the door when I walked away. Right. Yeah. I know. I can see but that. he would have heard somebody say, help. Yes. I just no, wish I, they right. would have said something. I know. I it just You hear this so often where people are so under these people's thumb. They listen to them. They don't say anything and they, they don't. Just well, I mean, they might not even have known it was a prison guard who came to the door. I just pictured two little girls that have experienced all this trauma. Yeah. They might not even have been listening. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, they might not even have known what was happening. They just hid behind the door because they were scared. Who knows if it was another person coming to harm them? Yeah. I know. I know. I just... Just in there. It breaks my heart that they were still alive. It I just know. does. What a monster. I know. So he was able to move the girls then to the family farm the next day. And on August 16th, he took Karen, the youngest, out into the woods. He told her to turn around so that he could urinate. And then he used this moment to shoot her in the back of the head. He killed Janet the next day in exactly the same way. And it was then that he took their bodies back to the car, hid the bodies in the trunk, and drove it to where it was found a month later. So where was the car in the meantime? Do we know? <clears throat> We, you know what? I don't know that piece because of Because it was over a week and he had the car with the dead bodies in it. Without... He probably hid it somewhere in the woods Ugh. on a back road that nobody would go down, you know, or covered it in tree branches. Who knows? So to corroborate the story, Detective Mice Eason looked up the prison guard. and He did, in fact, remember that day that he had knocked on, you know, on his door to inform him about the prisoner's fishing. I'm sure he was probably the only little fishing cabin out there. The only person that he had to go talk to. Um, and then when they were walking around, uh, walking around the cabin, they found his initials carved into the wall and then right next to it was a JJ for Janet Johnson, the older, the older girl. So Libel was interviewed 25 years later and he said, and I quote, that's how close everyone was to them. But for a cruel act of fate, those two precious little girls wouldn't be alive today. David Shearing has been up for parole a few times. In 2008, the board ruled that he still had violent sexual fantasies and he had not yet completed sex offender treatment, so of course it was denied. Again in 2012, he was denied due to a petition that had over 13,000 signatures. And again in 2014, he actually withdrew his parole request a month prior to his hearing. And at that time, the family was already ready to bring in yet another petition with over 15,000 signatures that would hopefully help yeah. get the denial. To date, David has changed his name to David Ennis, his mother's maiden name, and he currently uh, resides in prison, and he is 61 years old. And I hope he stays there forever. Well, and good, because I have something that you can do to help. Oh. 
So as it turns out, David has another parole review coming up in July of this year. If he receives full parole, he will be allowed to live among the community once again, under certain conditions, of course, but you and I know what this means. Currently, there's another online petition to keep this man behind bars. Tammy Arishinkov was a childhood friend of Janet's, and she is the one who started the most recent petition. And in the article that I read, she was trying to get 15,000 signatures again. I'm very happy to report that as I was signing it the other day, they had just hit 38,500 signatures. Good for them. So I honestly don't know what'll be enough in the eyes of the parole. This sounds like enough, but I think we can all send a powerful message. So if you have a minute, head over to change.org and sign it. Search for Keep David Ennis, and that's E-N-N-I-S, convicted. There's a bit more to the title, but that'll get you there. So please consider, you know, hopping on and showing your support. In the petition, it states, We, the undersigned, feel that the release of David Ennis, formerly David Shearing, into the community would jeopardize the safety of all citizens, but most importantly, our children. 100%. We're with you, Tammy, and family and friends. And I just, I know it takes a lot for these for these people that, that knew the family and who were close with them to have to get themselves together every few years to have to deal with the pain of this loss again and keep this monster behind bars. You know, can you even imagine? No, it's every couple of years. It's a lot of work. Does it matter that we don't live in Canada? You know, I hopped on and they took my signature. So I don't think it matters. Okay. That's I mean, what I was curious because we're not yeah. residents. I mean, that's, that's a good point, but... I signed it anyway. Oh, no. I mean, everyone <laughs> so, should sign it. But I was just yeah. curious if that would play into recognizing mm-hmm. yeah. who's signing it from where. I'm really curious to see where they're at. Because, I mean, as I signed it, it was just going up and up and up. Yeah. It was really cool to see that people were just signing away. We all know people like that Rio Fund. Mm-hmm. No. It's sh- not a mystery. They shouldn't get out. He actually, I didn't put it in my, in my story, but he actually remarried in 1995. And his wife is urging for him to get out she says that he's he's ready and that he's you know who marries that monster Mm -hmm. so they got married in prison Mm -hmm. so she's never actually met him Mm -mm. someone needs to smack her too i'm sorry i'm sorry but i don't support that (laughs) no of course people can be really mad at me about that i just don't well you know i think that's just stupid i don't understand the mentality of someone that's just like hey you know what i haven't had any i haven't been very lucky in love i think i'm gonna find a prisoner (laughs) what are you doing kidnapped two children killed their family Mm -hmm. no at least find someone less offensive i don't know does that i don't write prisoners and find your future husband in jail I'm sorry. You're right. People are not going to like that, but I don't care. (laughs) I don't care. There's some things I feel strongly about. And prisoners getting married like that, I think, is stupid. I know we can't take away all of their rights, whatever, blah, 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 but that's dumb. So be it. Yeah. Uh, So find us on Instagram and Facebook. (laughs) Tell us what you think about that. Um, And I don't know what I'm going to talk about. Oh, because it's going to be. We're having, we're taking a week off, so there won't be. We are. You won't hear from us. I think it's March twenty second. Mm-hmm. Because you'll yeah. be gone, and I'll yeah. be gone. We're calling it a spring break break. Yeah, a spring break break. <laughs> uh, so I have. There's. I think there's only one week left in March, right? That I'm going to be telling a story, and I'm not sure what mm-hmm. I'm going to do yet. It's gonna, might be a surprise. Yeah, that's okay. Surprise me, and then like I said, maybe we'll maybe we'll take a, a little break in April, and we'll do something. We'll really mix it up, and we'll find some crimes, but we'll we'll make them lighter and. You know, yeah, maybe no murder. Maybe we'll. What do you think about that? Yay, nay. <laughs> what doesn't bother me? I like any crime. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we'll take a break and do some lighter crime. Something, something interesting to dive into where nobody dies. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see what we can come up with for you. All right. So until then, hop over and you know find us, the Wicked Ones Podcast, wherever you listen and rate and review. Tell your friends. Please do. All right. Have a good one. Bye bye. Bye-bye.